All right, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today in this uh, webinar sponsored by the United States Aquaculture Society, the National Aquaculture Association, and the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. We're happy to have Hui Tran with us today, who's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the basics of recirculating aquaculture systems. Hui's a senior biologist uh, with the company called Aquatic Equipment and Design. And he's got over 30 years of experience in the aquaculture industry. So we're happy to have him. He's been a farm manager and a system designer and worked with about 29 different species, uh, designing systems for both commercial producers as well as educators. And he is going to talk to us about the basics of uh, recirculating system design. And he has lots of experience because he worked for Aquatic Ecosystems and the catalog company for over 17 years. So we're happy to have them. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, if you will, uh, please make sure your microphones are muted. And remember that we will post these recordings after today uh, on the uh, Aquaculture Education and More uh, YouTube channel, as well as the United States Aquaculture Association YouTube channel, or Aquaculture Society channel. And then there'll probably be a link from the uh, National Aquaculture Association channel as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Hui and we will go ahead and get started. And if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and we will try and answer them. I'll try and record them uh, and we'll try and get to some of those at the end. All right, Hui, take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, we'll get started here. Um, I'm just going to cover the basic components and basic principles in design. Um, there's many ways to do it, but I'll cover the majority or the most common ways that's done. Um, RAS, or recirculating aquaculture technology, um, the, the reason why we do it, it increases control, minimize water usage. Uh, we can go with a much higher density. Uh, biosecurity is, is, is a very important aspect of it. We can have year-round growing, and there is not a limit in the species that we can do. Uh, we just have to understand their biology first and um, how to reproduce them. The problem is the reason why I have that asterisk on there is just because we can do the species does not necessarily make it a good candidate just because of the cost of doing it or the market. Uh, you know, we probably wouldn't want to grow salmon here in Florida, uh, which we do have a farm that's doing that. Um, it, does it make economic and financial sense, first of all? Um, and then uh, RAS is really important uh, because it, it, it gives us a much more controlled environment in which to uh, culture our species. Again, um, minimize water usage, uh, conserves heat if we have to heat or cool the system. It really decreases water demand because I can culture at a much higher, much greater density and I can filter and treat that water. Uh, definitely increase biosecurity for escapes and um, um, uh, introduction of other species. Um, I can deal with uh, controlled environment and um, uh, gives me a lot of control and um, it control the animal growth where um, I can dictate uh, the amount of the volume in which I do based on the market needs. Um, one of the things that we should probably look at more in RAS is the, uh, the sustainability of RAS, um, maybe lower head application, a lower energy system, uh, zero or near zero discharge and lower trof uh, trophic species. We tend to do a lot higher um, trophic species, kind of like tuna or, you know, salmon, uh, salmonids. Um, you know, we, we don't tend to do like tilapia or, you know, other species like that. Uh, in other parts of the world where milkfish, tilapia, lower trophic species tend to do quite well in our markets, uh, in their markets. We can also add in uh, aquaponics um, or do a bioflock system or a green water system uh, as 
can be in, incorporated or part of brass. Um, the different, uh, the difference between some of the species that we talk with about every time we talk about RAS, all it is is just a recirculating aquaculture system. So most time people think about it as just commercial size, but hobby education system, basic entry level, uh, small scale system, and vertically integrated system. All of these are 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 recirculating system. These are some of the basic components that we'll be talking about. Um, the fish culture tank, the aeration or oxygen, uh, oxygenation input, disinfection, uh, waste, uh, solid removal, um, biological filtration and uh, removal of uh, CO2 as our density goes up. Um, and then some of the other components that we'll barely touch on is the what we do with that waste process, mineralize it, go into other system like aquaponics or a bioflock type system. Uh, some minor stuff that we do tend to uh, overlook sometimes is monitored control. And then we also have to deal with um, biosecurity. Uh, production systems um, really should um, uh, be supported by credible design. I've seen so many systems that is trying to reinvent the wheel or, or, you know, haven't done the research and they're making the same mistakes that I see year after year after year. Also when designing an RAS um, a system uh, or before purchasing an existing system, you should undertake a really comprehensive uh, financial analysis uh, to identify acceptable level of investment. Uh, so you're doing basically a, a, um, a kind of a walkthrough uh, due diligence on the system, and, and which is very commonly overlooked. I'm not sure why that is. It's just like any other investment, uh, any other business, you kind of have to do that due diligence. Uh, again, don't recreate the wheel work on some existing technology, uh, you know, learn on the mistakes of others that will help so much financially and not repeat some of the, the more common mistakes. And then also how and when to best integrate certain components. Uh, detail is definitely in the proper design. Um, I could probably do a book or a series of presentation just on incorrect designs. Uh, beware of awkward shysters or paper engineer who sells you uh, design or pre-done system. Um, that, that's really important. I see a lot of systems that are not suitable for certain species. Uh, one of the more common ones I've seen just recently is a salmonid system sold for someone that is doing a marine warm water species. Uh, and the system failed after about a year and a half. Uh, some really, really terrible design. If you look at this pipe, it's not supported except for these pieces of plastic that's under this cradle. So these, these small mistakes, they add up significantly. That's a 36 inch diameter pipe. That's a lot of weight on that little point loading. Here's another system. Uh, these are overflow or drains flowing there's actually 14 of these things. I've only caught like 12 in the photo, but all going into a common uh, drum filter. Originally, they didn't even have any type of label, so they didn't even know which drain was which. We finally had them label it, but it's still a nightmare to deal with. So just proper design uh, will save you all kinds of headache and mortality. Uh, basic components we'll touch on is culture tank, water movement, pumping, uh, filtration, both mechanical and biological, gas control, whether we're oxygenating, aerating, or degassing in the system, uh, disinfection, uh, UV, ozone, and then basic monitor and controls. Uh, the crucial factors in a tank design um, is where the drain is located, um, the return manifold design, width to height ratio, uh, optimal drain design is um, 
so far is basically the Cornell dual drain system. Um, the drain from the side receives the majority of the flow and the bottom drain takes just a heavy effluent. And that way you can kind of divide up the flow and, and go with a smaller mechanical filtration, which is a, a pretty major cost. Um, tank design and material. Uh, material for tanks should be constructed in something that's very durable, smooth, inert, and non-toxic, of course. Uh, tank construction that we see out there most common are fiberglass, uh, HDPE, which is a high density polyethylene, uh, concrete that has a treated or a coating on it, uh, steel with epoxy or with a glass coating, um, which is very common also, and then a corrugated steel with a liner. Uh, corrugated steel is usually uh, grain silos um, pieces, and then it has a liner um, to protect it and to maintain uh, water volume. Uh, some basic design for return manifold. Um, and this design is, is very simple. Uh, it gives a good water distribution. In the old days, we just had a, a pipe come into a tank and that was it. Um, but as the tank size grew and as the dimensions and, and volume and, and uh, density grew, we had to make better designs uh, in order to get the correct flow and help flush that waste out of that system much faster and get it into filtration. Water movement. Um, pumps are a very common device. Uh, sizing is very dependent on system volume and your turnover rate. Uh, standard turnover rate is anywhere from 30, um, uh, every 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, most of the time we deal with is mostly in the 60 minute range, uh, one turnover every 60 minute or every hour. Um, types of pump include centrifugal pump, which are kind of the more common swing pull pump, like the very bottom here. Uh, the vertical turbine, which are very large pumps, uh, the bright red one in the upper right hand corner, uh, basic submersible pump, uh, upper left-hand corner. Be careful with the submersible pump. You got to understand that there's electricity in the water and also oils that are usually used to cool and lubricate the pump. Um, so make sure you get the suitable uh, pumps. The magnetic driven pumps are tend to be a little bit smaller, um, maybe not for huge commercial system, but uh, that's... Uh, they're pretty nice and, and they're good for uh, salt water environment. Instead of have a shaft running through it, it has magnetics uh, to, to drive the impeller. Okay. Uh, filtration, we're gonna talk about mechanical filtration first. So mechanical filtration is, to de is designed to remove the solids in a recirculating aquaculture system. Um, RAS really should incorporate um, separate treatment stream, uh, double drain for settlement, um, uh, for settable solids um, of a hundred, greater than a hundred micron. Uh, that will help reduce some of the backwashing. Uh, mechanical filters should treat all water. Uh, there shouldn't be any type of side stream to mechanical filtration. Uh, all the water that's in your system or recirculating should go through some type of mechanical filtration. Um, and then the maximum um, uh, size of mechanical filtration should probably be uh, greater than 60 micron for aquaponics because we don't want to filter out some of the trace nutrients. But for aquaculture, they're tending to go much finer. Uh, 40 is pretty standard, but more and more systems are going down to 20 microns. Um, and sizing of these um, uh, uh, size particle filtration is based on flow rate and loading. So milligrams per liter, so parts per million, basically. Uh, mechanical filters should be able to be cleaned easily, backwash, um, and it should have a minimum uh, or minimize the, the amount of water it takes to, to uh, clean them. Um, in the old days, we used a lot of sand filter that channeled and, and stuff like that. And take, it, it took quite a volume just to backwash your mechanical filtration. 
Uh, basic rule of thumb uh, for every pound or every kilo of feed, you're going to end up with uh, 0.3 pounds or 0.3 kilos of solids. So basically a third of your solid is going to come from your uh, amount of feed that you put in. Uh, these are some basic particle size uh, that each type of filter is able to filter out or the ranges of it. Uh, drum screen filter is probably the most common and most prolific um, used for the larger system for sure. And they're nice because they actually remove the waste continuously out of the system. So they're not trapping and holding that, that waste so it leaches out. It's actually removing it. Uh, from the system as it collects it. Um, and the variety of screens uh, sizes is, is excellent. Uh, they go as low as 19 micron and as high as 150. Um, and they can be used in a gravity fed or a low pressure system. And again, it is self cleaning, which is very important. This is the basic uh, mechanics of how a drum filter works. There's a technology that's um, more, you're seeing more and more of it now is the disc filter. It works on the same principle, but is in disc and has a lot more surface area. Uh, it, there is a significant price increase with the disc filter, but it's usually for much larger size uh, system, uh, large high, uh, greater flow rate and uh, loading. Um, here are some of the drum filters that are most prevalent in the industry. Um, and I would use a, a credible or a, a well-known brand. There are some off brands or some that's been developed in the koi industry. They don't tend to be as re robust um, and they don't tend to have the technical support um, or the parts as in uh, replacement parts. Uh, bead filters and sand filter is a uh, it can be a uh, backwash um, with either increased flow or some type of blower or drop mechanism uh, that creates a, a, uh, a stirring of the, uh, the media. Um, there are medium uh, bead filters are usually medium pressure and then uh, sand filter or um, glass media filter are high pressure. And they're very common, very readily available. Here's some examples of bead filters. Um, if you see the, um, the one on the far left, it has a prop wash. It helps with the agitation of the media. So during backwash, that prop kicks on and it helps uh, agitate and breaks up that waste uh, media a little bit better. Um, the one, the second one from the left, um, it has it has a drop action where it helps agitate that waste, uh, agitate that medium and separates the waste. The one in the middle um, has a blower. Uh, they're jacuzzi type blowers, uh, the same blowers used to make jacuzzi tubs. Uh, it agitates that, that fixed bed in there and it helps uh, facilitates uh, the cleaning of that bed. Uh, the last one on the far right is a, uh, has a drop filter mechanism and it induces air into a bottom chamber. And then it, uh, when, that, when that air becomes a certain volume, it, um, it trips the trigger and it uh, creates a, a backwash. Uh, swirl separators and settling filters um, are very passive, but they tend to only filter out much larger um, um, solids. The nice thing is there's very little or no energy is needed to run them. Um, excellent for removing large solids, like I said, uh, but it usually has to be combined with additional filtration, additional mechanical filtration. Um, here's an example of a swirl separator. Um, and then there's some updated design of swirl separators that are uh, radio flow separator. Um, example of the drawing on the far left is a radio flow separator. The one in the middle is actually a homemade one at uh, University of Virgin Island. Uh, this is back in the Jim Ricosi days for his aquaponic system. Uh, the one on the far right there is a homemade system 
um, that works quite well. Uh, it uses a bunch of swimming pool, uh, pond skimmer. It was also for an aquaponics uh, facility. The, the, the Hydrotech uh, belt filters or just belt filters in general uh, are phenomenal. They work really well at separating the, um, uh, the, the solid waste from the, the water. Uh, but they are very, very expensive and they tend to be used more in um, dewatering type of uh, application. Uh, very expensive and mechanically um, a, a little bit more to work uh, service has to be needed uh, for, for operation. Uh, the next filtration we're talking about is biological filtration or nitrifying uh, filters. Um, the biological filters are a central component of uh, RAS and aquaponics, anything to deal with, with living organism, we need to treat that um, nitrification cycle, right? So the dimensions of biological filter can be uh, determined through mass balance calculation. So based on the number of, or the volume or the weight of feed that you put in, you know how much uh, ammonia you'll be producing. And then we can calculate on what's the actual size of biological filter we need. It's all based on surface area. And so the bacteria needs a certain amount of, of surface area to grow on. And then you know you need a certain amount of bacteria to treat a particular volume of ammonia. Um, this is very important. Most people, when they size biological filters, they're just talking about surface area. You really should be talking about usable surface area. Uh, here's a really simple rule of thumb is the, um, the, the process in uh, nitrification. So ammonia oxidizing bacteria, nitrosomonas, and then uh, nitrite oxidizing bacteria, nitrobacter. Um, this is pretty common. The uh, biofiltration uh, unit process, um, it really you should go through a mechanical filtration first before you go through biological filtration. And in order to do that, uh, you, you do that in order to um, maintain a better biological filter. You're not clogging it up with waste. So always go through mechanical filtration first. Um, nitrification, again, it's all about surface area, but usable surface area. So it's just a, a area or a, a place where the bacteria can live um, and, and uh, be safe from you know, competition. Uh, and these are aerobic process. So make sure they're well aerated or there's a, a certain amount of DO in the system. Uh, basic rule of thumb for every kilogram or, or a pound of feed you put in 0 0.03 kilogram or pound if you go either way will be ammonia. Um, biofiltration, the process, if you're looking at one gram of ammonia produced, you're, can, um, you're, can, you're putting out, um, you're, you're producing 4.4 uh, grams of nitrate and then 5.9 grams of carbon dioxide. So that's pretty significant. And it also consumes 4.34 grams of O2. So in reality, your biofilter is actually consuming more O2 than your fish at times. And then it's also consuming 7.15 grams of alkalinity. Um, a lot of times I see this um, when, uh, you know, customers or clients call me and they say, hey, uh, our system's having a high nitrite uh, problem. And that usually occurs in the beginning when they're starting up their system. Um, or someone else has undersized their, their biofilter. And most of the time when they undersize it, they look at total surface area and not looking at usable surface area. Or the, there's not enough oxygen or DO um, in their uh, biofilter. Because remember, this is an aerobic process. Um, biofiltration. Um, these are some low head uh, biofilter um, design. The, 
the moving bed or the mixed bed uh, bioreactor, that's that colonist media, the plastic media that tumbles that you, you see um, in, in many system. The trickling or the downflow uh, biofilter. RBC uh, is another very common one. Uh, although you don't see it as much anymore uh, due to the, the weight gain uh, over time. And then the submerse biofilter. Um, this one I have to say with a, a amount of caution. The submersible uh, biofilter or submersed biofilter has to be done correctly. Um, they, they tend to be much harder to clean and then they, they can run into problem. The moving bed, I, I guess I have some bias because that seems to be the most robust. And coming from Florida, uh, we go through power outage a lot of time during hurricane season and um, they tend to be the much more robust than any other system that we've used. These are some uh, mixed bed bioreactor or the moving bed bioreactor. Um, all it is is media uh, agitated um, and water, your system water flows through it. So if you look at that system on the bottom left-hand corner, it goes through the drum filter first. Uh, you can see the drum filter at the uh, top right-hand corner of that particular photo. Then it goes into the biofilter. Uh, this is the trickle down uh, or down uh, flow uh, biofilter. Uh, it has a media in a container and then uh, water is trickled down into it. Uh, they can be very efficient uh, and relatively cheap. If you're talking about the uh, microbeads, which is a polystyrene bead that you find in beanbag chair, uh, there is a static charge on those and dealing with those things, uh, they get everywhere. Um, when you're pouring into your, uh, your system. It is relatively cheap. The only drawback is over time, it does get compressed and it gets into your system and we have found it in fish guts. Uh, RBC or rotating biological contactor. Uh, they were popular at one time, not as much anymore. Um, uh, the older design had a, a shaft running through the center and it had a driving motor. Um, over time though, it got extremely heavy and uh, the steel shaft of a, a two inch or three inch diameter even would, would bend over time. And then the driving motor would burn out. Later on, they developed ones uh, like the ones on the left there. Um, they float and they had a weir uh, in the center of the, um, uh, of the uh, roller and it uses air. So it looks like a water wheel with air in reverse and it uh, rotated them that way. Over time, what happened though, is the bacteria did not build up uh, evenly. So sometimes it wobbled or it wouldn't rotate uh, properly. And then you had to clip on weights. Uh, it was still somewhat of a challenge, but they're, they're pretty robust. I see them more now on smaller systems. Uh, the submersible filter, like a gravel bed biofilter or the, uh, the trickling, um, they can be relatively cheap. The problem is, is the maintenance, keeping them clean over time. Um, it's just not easy. And then the, the way you distribute the water is not always perfect. And it can go um, anaerobic pretty easily. Um, pressurized biofilter, um, we see that um, on, on certain design based on, um, you know, their, their requirements. Uh, it does require more energy and there is a, a um, additional cost. And also there's some problems with blowouts if you're not designed in um, uh, some safe, uh, safety measures. Uh, so the bead filters can be also be used as biological filter, although I tend to recommend using them as either mechanical or biological. I wouldn't use one vessel to do both uh, because as it clogs as a mechanical filter and you backwash it, you're losing some of your biological capacity because you're flushing out some of those uh, bacteria. And over time, you're constantly doing that. So as the mechanical part of it's working well, it can go anaerobic and you know you could cause problems for your bacteria. So uh, I would use it as one or the other. 
there is, uh, they do fluidize uh, beads also. Um, just be aware that over time, the bacteria builds up on these media and it changes the displacement. And so sometimes uh, these uh, media can get out into your system because they, they'll float out of their containment uh, area because of displacement. So you make sure you have some contingency to catch that. Fluidized sand filter. Um, it's, it, they're super nice when they're working. Um, they do have some, because you're, you're sandblasting in your system basically. So they do erode over time and then they do, um, the sand gets out into your system so they can damage pumps and, and all kinds of other stuff. So over time, the bacteria film develops around the sand and it changes the displacement and the, 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 um, the density. So um, you make sure you have to have some contingency to catch that, that sand. Um, every sand filter, I've not seen a sand filter that has not lost sand. So uh, every single design I've seen has have uh, sand coming out of them. So over time, you definitely need to have contingency for that. Um, then we're, we're gonna move into oxygen. Um, provision for pure oxygen or liquid generated, or liquid or generated oxygen, uh, it's recommended for higher stocking density for sure. Uh, anything above, um, you know, 30 to 40 kilograms uh, per liter. Um, or I, I, would, I would recommend, you can go higher, uh, but that's tend to be the, the industry recommendation. I've seen as high as 50 before they go to uh, pure oxygen. Um, one of the reasons why is, is RAS requires that higher stocking density, higher growth rate to be economically um, viable, right? And um, O2 addition should be considered going design uh, in the earlier stages. So you can take advantage of, of capital uh, rate 80, the, the economics of uh, scale. Uh, this is where the auction process goes into the uh, layout. Uh, sources, uh, O2 generation, uh, liquid ox, or cylinder. Uh, O2 generation works well. Uh, the generators are, 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 you know, they come in all sizes. One of the conditions, though, is they prefer cool, dry environment to generate oxygen. Uh, we work in aquaculture, so cool and dry is uh, two luxury we usually don't have. Um, liquid ox uh, can be um, set up on site and they can come and fill it uh, on a regular basis. Cylinder is more for backup. Um, it's not a, a, a viable mainstay for, for uh, systems. Um, the application for these are uh, downflow contactor, uh, low head oxygenation devices or LHO, and then counterflow uh, diffusion columns. Here are the different generators. I mean, they come in, in various, various size. Um, they do need to be serviced. And again, they prefer a dry, cool environment. These are the liquid ox. Um, the, the nice thing about the liquid ox is, let's say you lose power, you will still always have oxygen in your system because the gas are constantly expanding. So if you have a backup plan into your system, with a normally uh, open solenoid or normally closed solenoid, and then normally open when you lose power or open when you lose power, it's a, it's a great backup. And for higher density, absolutely. Um, these are some of the downflow uh, contactor or reverse flow. Um, and these are super, super efficient. Um, uh, commercial application, this is really kind of the way to go uh, with higher density. Uh, their efficiency is above 90%. Um, LHOs are nice because they tend to use a lot less energy. Uh, let me back up to that. These type of system, they prefer about seven to 12 PSI. Uh, so you, there's, a, there's definitely an increase in energy cost to um, to increase the pressure to saturate that water with uh, O2. Um, LHO is basically a gravity feed into the top of the vessel and it trickles through a um, media 
uh, or, uh, or well, media to break up the water particle and then um, oxygen is injected uh, towards the, the bottom or the middle there and it rises through that water that has been broken up. So it's, it's pretty efficient. Uh, not quite as efficient as the saturator, but they're 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 quite good. And it, it um, in certain application, they 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 kind of win out just because it's a lower energy cost. And the designs have gotten better. Uh, camera flow. Um, these are some of the older YouTube type design or the um, uh, DVC. Um, uh, the downward bubble contactor. It works in almost the same basic principle of, as the saturator, uh, just not under as much pressure. Um, oxygen contactor, there's some percentage of it. The, uh, I'm pretty conservative there, uh, saying the efficiency is about 80 to 90. It's tend to be 90 and a little bit higher now with the uh, more efficient designs. Um, aeration should be used with a system that's less than uh, 35 to 40 uh, kilograms per cubic meter, uh, diffusers or air stones, uh, mechanical agitator and pack column aerators are some of the choices for that. Um, it is important to understand where your system is located because a lot of these um, when you're using aeration, there is less air at altitude. So make sure you take that into consideration. Um, we had a customer that kept on buying blowers and injecting as much air as he could, and he could never get to saturation. What he didn't realize was he could never get to that saturation level using air because the efficiency of these blowers also depend on the percentage of oxygen in air at elevation. So just kind of be aware of that. These are some of the different uh, air diffusers. Um, this was the industry standard for the longest time, uh, a medium glass bonded uh, diffuser. Uh, it was originally invented by Bob Heidemann, uh, uh, the founder of Aquatic Ecosystem back in 84. Uh, actually, he founded it uh, or made it much earlier, but it didn't really make it to market. Um, till about 84. He tested in swim pools and most of the lakes and ponds around his home. Uh, very re low resistance and it had a, a decent transfer rate um, for diffusers compared to others. The mechanical agitators um, or aerators, um, they, they, they work quite well, um, although there is electricity in the water. And there is a cost because you're actually moving and pumping water and then you have an eductor, uh, which entrains air. The pack columns, uh, very common kind of old technology, but it helps break up that water molecule and it, it uh, saturates with the air much easier. Um, this is the same principle as degassing also. Uh, CO2 is definitely going to be a problem in your system um, when pure oxygen is used because your density is much greater. So you're producing a, a CO2 at a much higher volume uh, for a given um, uh, system. Uh, RAS uh, that uses pure oxygen should definitely incorporate some type of degassing device. Uh, and don't forget, CO2 is a heavy gas. And we had a client that was uh, degassing um, quite well, but he couldn't understand why his CO2 level was still climbing. The problem was CO2 is a heavy gas. He had his blower, which was aerating the system down low. So the CO2 pulled down low and the blower was actually regassing CO2 instead of air. Uh, and these are some common degassing or treatment for CO2. Uh, disease control is very, very important um, because you can lose your whole crop in, in, uh, uh, due to disease. The best way to deal with disease control is to look for it early and not react. Um, so if you can be proactive, it's much, much easier. Um, 
and it should be incorporated not just in RASP, but in all fish system. Um, some of the common devices used is uh, UV or ultraviolet light uh, radiation and ozone um, is used in, in most RAS system. Um, ozone is phenomenal. It is a very powerful oxidant. Uh, it can be used in aquaculture to improve water quality and clarity. Um, and it works very well with many pathogen. Um, and it treats, you, you can treat your system water, but also you can treat the effluent before you discharge that water. Or you can even treat incoming water if you're worried about pathogens. Um, ozone um, causes clumping or microflocculation of fine particles, and it facilitates a much better um, uh, mechanical filtration and removal of those particles. Uh, due to the high oxidation potential of ozone is very, very reliable disinfectant. It's a non-selective though. So whatever is there is going to attack the, the easiest organism and then it moves on to the next thing. If there's nothing else in the system, if you're not careful, the ozone can actually react uh, with the organism that you're trying to culture. Uh, ozone is very powerful. It's usually about 400 times stronger than chlorine bleach. So be, um, be careful with it and make sure you have someone that knows what they're doing to size and um, destruct your ozone. Uh, most time when we deal with ozone, we actually have a uh, ambient air detection. If there's a, any type of leak. If you smell ozone, it's already too late. It's already doing damage to you. So just be very careful with ozone. It's a phenomenal, uh, disinfectant, um, it's, it's almost too good. So just, um, just be aware of that. UV is another common one. Uh, at 254 nanometer wavelength, uh, UV light penetrates cell walls of microorganism and the amount of UV delivered to an organism is called the intensity. Um, UV permanently alters the DNA structure of a microorganism and it renders it uh, unable to reproduce or infect your, um, your culture species. Um, UV uh, triggers inactivation within seconds. Now, the thing with UV is it works based on how clear your water is. So transmitting rate, so UV is a light. If your water is look like chocolate milk, don't even bother with UV because it's not gonna transmit enough photos or light through that water to do any good. So it's very critical to understand how UV is used and what's needed to um, have your UV be effective. Uh, monitoring and control, uh, RAS systems should definitely be equipped with some type of monitoring. Um, and at, at density, a uh, system can crash within minutes. So you definitely want to have some type of monitoring. And any of you guys who've been farm manager, uh, those system crashes are problem it always seems to be to the 4 a.m. and on the weekends and holidays. So um, have a monitoring control system, but have a reliable one. Uh, nothing more annoying as a farm manager and you get these alarms all the time and they're false alarms. And then when the real problem comes, you're not ready for it. Uh, some of the parameters that should be monitored is uh, basically, uh, DO would say probably number one, um, but you can also monitor uh, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, um, pH. These are the continuous monitor that I would say it's, it's crucial, uh, DO temp, flow, and uh, water levels. Um, but also make sure your DO is located, DO probe is located in the right area. I've seen farm where they have their DO probe located uh, in the upper water column and they had a small leakage. And as the water was leaking out of their system, the DO was showing it was still good, uh, but the water level got low enough that most of their fish perished. So um, just make sure it's located wherever you have your probe and monitor is located in the appropriate area. Um, other um, water parameters that you should be looking at at least periodically is pH um, and uh, the rest of these. These can be done with a test kit versus a probe. Some of the probes can't really do um, ammonia, nitrite, nitrates all that well. 
uh, in the high levels, but not in, in alcohol, fine for wastewater, but in aquaculture, um, it, it wouldn't work. These are some examples of the simple control and monitor out there. Uh, sensor phone's been around forever. It's basically a contact switch and it's uh, started out as a household uh, a house alarm, basically. Uh, the YSI does is a simple off the shelf and it, it has a lot of capacity. If you want to go overboard, um, there is controls that can do everything. Uh, flow, how much your pump is amp is drawing, um, water quality. It can actually hook up to Doppler and warn you of um, impending storms. Uh, so these are, are pretty significant. Just make sure you need it before you put it in. Uh, the costs on these are, are quite substantial. Absolutely have to have some type of water quality lab, whether it be a simple test kit or a full blown lab like this. You have to understand your base water quality uh, before you can kind of troubleshoot some of the issues. Here's some simple water quality test kits. Um, the Lamont uh, fish farm um, or the Lamont uh, aquaponics test kit. It's a color metric using a titration method, really simple. Um, it, it does have some level of human error or consistency. So you should make sure that uh, you understand and know how to use these first, or you have one person consistently doing it because each person sees a color slightly different. Uh, so you don't want too much variation. Uh, another one is the, uh, the one on the right there, the YSI 9500 is a photo spectrometer really. So those are super nice. Um, Biosecurity, uh, it's, it's very important. A lot of farms and especially a lot of beginning farms where they're trying to find investors uh, allow tours and stuff like that. I just cringe at that. And I don't know how many tours I've been where I see someone stick their hand in the water. That just drives me nuts. So be very careful of, of biosecurity. Most of the mishap or disease that come into the farm is due to the lack of biosecurity. Uh, some essential component, um, water supply, culture tank, mechanical filtration, all the stuff that we just covered um, are important. Some supporting components is, you know, uh, structure for housing uh, system, uh, water quality, alarm, feeding systems, storage facilities, staff amenities like bathroom, changing rooms, break room, uh, administration and workshop facility. Um, Smaller facility, every place is a workshop facility, basically, because you're always repairing something. Uh, additional components are nice to have. It's definitely a quarantine, some type of purging system. Um, if you can produce your own fry and fringling or someplace to house them so you can get them in at a lower price. Uh, brood stock management, maybe a little bit uh, higher level of skills needed for husbandry wise, and then some type of biosecurity program. Uh, feeding um, and feed rates, um, you really should have some type of feeding and feed rate chart um, listed out at your farm because feed is such a, a significant cost, top five. So you want to make sure you manage that. I've seen so many places uh, waste so much feed and in turn, you're overworking your filtration system and you're throwing out feed basically. Um, some pre-designed system, they always tell you what kind of pipe size and, and you know, design uh, criteria. Uh, just make sure it's suitable for your needs. Uh, a lot of these turnkey or pre-designed system cookie cutters are not always suitable for uh, uh, certain species or your, your application. Uh, basic nutrient that's coming out of a RAS system, and this is the reason why uh, effluent coming out of a drum filter of a RAS system. This is why we tend to do other, um, we either have to treat that water or deal with that nutrient or that waste coming out, or we can use it in a, like an aquaponic uh, application. Um, it's important because it creates additional opportunity and then you can get an aquaponics crop within seven to 14 days versus your six month to one year investment in your fish. Um, it can generate a secondary um, uh, crop while remove, um, removing final waste product. Uh, system has the ability to grow many different plant species. Uh, 
I have myself done over 300 and 350 variety of plants in aquaponics and it requires, it does require additional staff and knowledge and markets. Basic aquaponics system. This is just a deep water bed uh, DWC and you can see how many different variety is growing in one system. And then you can see the difference in day one versus uh, 18 days later, day 19, uh, the growth. This is a small RAS system that uses aquaponics to treat their water uh, tilapia facility. Um, there are some considerations, especially when you're dealing with saltwater system. Um, it's very similar to the freshwater that has the same stream of treatment, mechanical, biological, uh, disinfection, uh, but you just have to make sure the material you use in these components are uh, compatible with salt water. And then uh, you do need an addition uh, from fractionated or a protein skimmer in salt water application. And then the selection of biofilter is very important for salt because salt water reacts differently to certain materials used in uh, media used in biofiltration. Okay, blew through that pretty quick. Um, I think we have time for questions. Uh, a recirculating aquaculture system. Great, thank you. We have um, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so, I'll, so next question is about Vircon and whether or not that's the recommended disinfectant. And if so, what are the pros of it over other methods? Um, Vircon, it, it works really well. Uh, make sure you get the right Vircon. There's, there's one for terrestrial animal and there's an aquatic Vircon. So make sure you get the right one. It's the, it's the easiest one. Uh, there are other methods. Uh, the nice thing about the Vircon, it's very stable versus um, other like peroxide or potassium permanganate or anything like that. So they're great for foot baths and stuff like that. Awesome. Um, next question actually came in before you talked about saltwater RAS, but are there any questions or any special considerations for shrimp in an RAS system? Um, yeah, shrimp, you definitely want some type of, of, uh, of protein skimmer and fractionation. And depends on how you have your system set up, you just want to make sure you have the appropriate flow rate just to get the waste out of the system because the shrimp system uh, in RAS tend to be larger surface area and more um, volume. So you, your water column, so the settling velocity, you have deposits of waste around the tank. So you just have to make sure you have good water circulation to get that waste to a drain. Which kind of leads great segue into the next question. Can you talk a little bit more about the skimmer? Uh, the protein skimmer is a vessel that injects um, air in and it causes a foaming and that foam has a charge that helps remove that nutrient or that waste. Um, and it, it, it's much, much more effective in salt water or as the salinity goes up, it's more effective. There are some um, protein skimmer designed for fresh water, uh, but they don't tend to work as well because of the surfactant, uh, the lack of surfactant in the uh, uh, fresh water. Um, there are a bunch of designs out there. Um, I, I tend to stick with a few um, brands that tend to work uh, better and been around more. It is a little bit more intensive, uh, energy intensive, because you're using a venturi or something to break up that bubble to much smaller in order to create that foam to remove that nutrient. Um, but in salt water, it, it's definitely a necessity. Uh, we see that time and time over again. Um, you can oversize the protein skimmer though. So if your protein skimmer is oversized, you're wasting money on the cost of the unit, electricity, but also it's removing certain trace minerals in salt water that you have to replenish. So be careful on how you size and deal with um, protein skimmers also. Great. And then the last question at the moment is, um, can you estimate a cost per cubic meter for a system? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I, would need, I would need a lot more information. What species, what density, um, what's your cost for electric per kilowatt. Um, and, and so that, yeah, there's, there's a whole host. If someone says they can, uh, they're giving you some really rough rule of thumb. And I really hate doing my business plan based on really rough rule of thumb. I, I need to be very, a lot more specific to, to, to size the system correctly. 
Great. Um, we actually have a couple more questions coming in, but um, Dave Klein had a couple of questions, so I'll turn it over to Dave for a few minutes. Yeah, I did. We I did have a couple come in um, privately, and one was about role the role of bioflocculants or probiotics in RAS, and then as well as um, well, would you use uh, bioflocculants? Yes, is the question. Um, you can um, if your system is done right. You don't need them. Uh, but you can use uh, some bioflocculant, uh, just make sure it's stable enough that it's not just going to overwhelm and, and just clog your system. Uh, your screen filters, if it's, it's super fine, you can clog the screen where you have to remove the screen and, and pressure wash with some real, you know, with a pressure wash or even acid to get rid of that bioflocculant. So just be, be aware. Um, and if it's not needed, I, I prefer not to add any additional chemical if it's not necessary. Very good. And uh, someone asked about if you would just re-explain where the blower was in relation to the CO2 and not being able to strip the CO2 from the system. Yeah. So the blower um, is also aeration, but uh, most CO2 or degasser uses some type of um, positive air to blow out the CO2 or some type of vacuum or you know, blower working reverse to suck the, the uh, CO2 out. I tend to recommend the, the latter where it's sucking the CO2 out instead of induce, inducing air at the bottom of a degasser because you can um, actually saturate it um, with nitrogen because you're, you're, you're blowing air in to the bottom under pressure. Um, and you know, air is mostly nitrogen uh, versus oxygen. I don't know if that's answer this question. Or are they talking about blower in the system or versus CO two degassing? Yeah, well, I think you were talking about CO two being a heavy gas, and if your blower is placed oh, low okay. on the ground, yeah. So some places, a lot of places have blowers on the ground because they're a big piece of equipment. And if you're degassing over or near a blower, that intake of that blower is sucking in that CO two. And it's regassing CO2 into your system versus air. Does that does that make sense? So I think that's what they were. I think yeah. that's what they're referring to. Um, and then one last one. Let's see. If you were producing a thousand metric tons of product, how many individual life support systems would you suggest? <laughs> um, what's your risk factor, uh, and what kind of risk you're willing to take? Um, the more redundant, the better, but it has to make financial sense, though. If you're so redundant that you, you lose out financially, uh, you're not sustainable as a business. So I would say at least um, uh, a few systems. Uh, uh, for something like that, it, it really depends on the species and the market and the volume in which you're, you're, you're getting it to market. So let's say 100 ton, 100 metric ton, What's the volume of market each time? I would break it down to that. So when you're harvesting, you're not harvesting the same system over and over. You're harvesting a complete system would be nice. Uh, less stress, less disease problem if, if you do it that way. Thanks, We. Um, I guess there were a few more questions that came in. I'm going to let Dennis propose those. OK, next up, how, if someone wanted a system design, how can they get, how can they get one? Um, there's, there's a bunch of really good uh, designers out there. Make sure your designer asks the appropriate question. Make sure the designers actually give you some type of mass balance so they understand how much fish that you want to produce, how much waste you're producing. That mass balance is your, like, your accounting of your system. They need to give you that. Um, you know, I, we definitely do it as a company. Um, we also review other designs too. So, um, but there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of good designers out there. Just make sure they, you get their resume, make sure they have um, your, your, your species or your type of market in mind when they do it. If it's a cookie cutter or you know, they have this one, one design to fix everything, uh, walk the other way right off the bat. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question, very specific. What should the capacity of a UV system be for a 10 ton seawater RAS system? So, <laughs> so 
Yeah, that really depends. I would need to understand what your transmitting rate is. Um, I prefer like 95 plus transmitting. And you're, you're, you should be talking somewhere of about 60,000 um, uh, microwatts per second per centimeter square is the dosage rate that you need. Um, if you have more questions, email me. Um, I can give you a much more specific. Uh, and also it depends on what you're trying to control. Uh, if you're looking for keep, you know, dealing with fecal coliform or something simple like that, it's 80 or 8,000 microwatts per second per centimeter square. But you're dealing with molds or you're dealing with um, uh, other pathogen, you could go as high as 300, 400,000 microwatts per second per centimeter square. So it varies, it depends on what you're having to deal with. Excellent. Our next question How many times does should the water circulate? in a system of 40 kilograms at, per cubic meter? Uh, one time every hour should be more than enough at 40 kilograms. Okay. Um, there was a que general question about if you have any information on mass production of zooplankton and RAS. Um, no, I don't. Um, it depends on, on what kind of zooplankton you're looking to do. There, there's my business partner has done quite a bit of mass uh, production of um, rotifers in, in RES, um, but uh, it depends on what zooplankton. But if you want specifically a rotifer, whether it be the S or SS, um, you can definitely contact my business partner Amy. She's done that for quite a bit of uh, quite a quite a while. Uh, two more questions at the moment. Um, how? What would the cost? What would be the cost of the most expensive system you have seen in terms of you know dollars per cubic meter? Um, I would probably have to say some of the the more intricate um, um, marine ornamental uh, or the the uh, um, some of the tuna facilities in Japan. Uh, unfortunately, I, I can't say the dollar amount for those because. Uh, they have some proprietary stuff that, unfortunately, I, I signed something that I can't say. <laughs> but they, they can get pretty significant. Um, for some of the, the, the tropical marine species that are ornamental, you're looking at uh, over $1,000 per cubic meter. That's amazing to, to even comprehend. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's, that's pretty nuts. But, you know, th their product uh, is, is way beyond food fish price, right? 